This podcast is brought to you by sarahraven.com, which is home to everything you need for a truly beautiful and productive garden. You'll also find great and essential gardening kit and stylish, lovely things to have in your house to bring the outside indoors, all inspired by the garden and the house being tied together. There's also plenty of garden inspiration, how-to videos and specialist growing guides. So head over to sarahraven.com today to discover even more. Welcome to Grow, Cook, Eat, Arrange, the podcast of me, Sarah Raven. And today I'm joined by Gary, who's been a repeater guest on the show, who's our senior horticultural buyer of um, the Mail Order Company. He is incredibly knowledgeable about new release plants, much more than me. I mean, so Josie and I trial lots of things here, but often supplied by Gary that he's seen from various breeders and his travels around the country and around Europe. And so we get them here. So welcome, Gary. It's lovely to have you back. It's good to be back. Thank you very much. We're going to talk about shrubs today, which is an area that you are particularly interested in at the moment. And I just wanted you to explain to everyone why it's become a new, well, not a new passion, but a sort of increased passion of yours. Yeah, I've just felt that in the past decade, we've been increasingly drawn to herbaceous planting, naturalistic styles. And it's not that shrubs have become unfashionable, it's just that they're not a priority when Mm. we come to planning the garden. And from a design point of view, I think it's really important that shrubs should be one of the first things that we consider, Mm. not because of the time scale it takes to establish them, but they create the structure of a garden for the herbaceous to grow around. And it's important that people don't forget shrubs when it comes to planning their space. Otherwise, Open space without shrubs mean a lack of shade. You don't get the shelter from winds. Um, There's a lot of practical reasoning behind having shrubs in the garden, as well as aesthetics that we can go on to later. There's plenty within the range to add a lot of loveliness to it, but there's a lot of um, practical reasons behind it as well. Yeah, and obviously they're incredibly low maintenance and lots of them are very drought resistant, which or kind of weather resistant. So whether it's really wet like it was this spring or really dry like it has been this summer, it means that you've got this real resilience, haven't you? Yeah, I, I was at an organic farm the other day and we were talking about the importance of the shelter belts and the increased winds that we're getting in spring now, which strips the moisture from the, the young plants. And without the established Mm. shrubs within the garden, the other things within there just wouldn't get a chance to establish and perform later on in the summer. So the increased importance and the changing climate that we have is shrubs really need to be a priority. Gosh, that's so interesting because if you you go to the Scilly Isles or to different parts of Cornwall, uh, but particularly the Scillies, which are obviously very windswept, even though they have this incredibly sort of wonderful microclimate they get a lot of sea salt winds and stuff and it's always this beautiful characteristic thing of the sillies which is that you have these very small fields with these shrub hedgerows around them and of course that's the same thing isn't it it's it's like really good protection but ornamental protection you know there they're often not particularly grown for being ornamental but that's what you're saying is that we can actually grow them to be an ornamental shelter belt Exactly, yeah. So to carry on our theme that we've had in 2023 of 12 best, I've asked Gary if he could name his six current favourites and I'm going to interleave those with my six favourites. So uh, Gary, do you want to kick off with number one? Great. So shall we start with the winter shrubs? I think we'll go. Yeah, great. Start Let's year. run through the year. Yeah. The uh, plant I want to really highlight is a, a Daphne, and I think a lot of our listeners will know Daphne is quite an extravagance in the garden. It's always felt they're quite a high price shrub, but there's a good mm. reason behind it. They're incredibly difficult to propagate. There's huge losses in production because it's very hard to get them to root at a young age. But there's one new variety that we've been selling for a couple of years now. It's called Perfume Princess, and it's a hybrid from New Zealand, and it's a cross between Daphne Adora and Daphne Balua. Oh. which are probably two really well-established, well-known Daphnes. And the idea is that it's taken the strong scent and the durability from those two varieties and combined it into a new 
ultra strong hybrid which gives you fantastic sort of sweet citrus almost spicy fragrance mm. but masses of blooms on quite a compact plant glossy evergreen leaves really great and the, the period of blooming is what's particularly special about it i, I would say from mid-january all the way up to early march it produces mm. clusters of uh, fragrant flowers oh nice gosh that sounds amazing I don't know that. Um, that's definitely going on my trial list. So you've trialed that in your own garden. Yeah, yeah. It's one of those plants that I, I picked up from a, a bargain basement somewhere and thought I'll give it a go. And it's just it's just done amazing in my garden since probably well, 18 months it's been in the garden now and it's, it's established really nicely. Fantastic. Well, um, for my winter one, I'm going to go for a plant you introduced me to or pointed out to me. And to be honest, I wasn't overly keen on them as a family, which is the Pittosporums, which is wrong. But I've I've had as a sort of ex florist, I had a slight prejudice against them because I used too many Pittosporums in the winter, in sort of winter wreaths and things. But I'm crazy about this new one, which is called Barrow Bay, or is it Bano Bay? You probably know more than me, Gary. Bano, Bano Bay, Bay, yeah, ba- Bano yeah. Bay. That's correct. And um, it's so brilliant for containers so I'm just finishing a book on plants for containers and so I wanted to try various evergreens for the winter that are are suitably small enough for containers but give you presents all the way through the year and look neat and tidy and obviously with the box moth and all the problems with box box is sort of receding as the plant of choice uh, for containers and this pittosporum is quite fantastic it's the darkest wine red leaf all the way through the winter and then in the spring and into the summer you get this bright green tips and it's really compact and I found I was hacking at it so much for winter flower arrangements into spring with my hellebores and things it's looking slightly shorn now so I'm going to plant lots more of that this autumn because I really I think I'm going to take them out of the containers actually and plant them in the cutting garden um, as a sort of undulating sort of architectural balls just like I would use box but it's it's um, my current one is about I don't know it's probably about forty five centimeters in a perfect globe and it's just so rich and so wonderful I absolutely love it. And you found it come through the winter okay? There was no damage from the frost at all, especially yeah, last winter. No, lo- yeah, lots of people said to me that they lost their pittosporums in the winter, but this one not at all, and it's in a pot, so you'd think it'd be even more vulnerable. That is the, the reasoning behind that variety, I think, as many people will know Tom Thumb which is kind of its predecessor. It's a compact yeah. pittosporum, really dark foliage, like you say, but it would have got caught by the la- last winter with the frost and some people might have even lost it as well. But Banner yeah. Bay is an improved variety, an improved form on that, so it's good to hear that it came through well. Yeah, it really has. It's absolutely fabulous. So back to you for number three for spring, perhaps? Spring, early spring, yep. So I've gone for Shinomalies, the Japanese flowering quince. We sell uh, one yeah. called Crimson and Gold. It's a funny shrub, isn't it? Because I think a lot of people will know it as a wool-trained, almost like a climber, treated like a climber where you tie it in and you prune it. And it's fabulous on a, a shady wall somewhere where lots of climbers don't like shade. So the Shinomalies is fantastic to tie in and train, fan train across the wall. And you get these really early flowers on the bare branches, mm. um, which are also great for cutting, obviously. I see it all the time now where you get the, the bare branches with, with the buds coming out and it looks really nice. Yeah. Look. yeah. So, and th- this plant as well, it's got uses as a hedge, fantastic wildlife hedge. It's got thorns on it. It has fruit with the, the quince it produces later in the year. Wow. Uh, the bees love the early flowers, really important source of nectar in the early part of the year, um, and a good boundary hedge as well. That's such a good idea. So is the English name for those wool quinces, is that japonica or is that, am I wrong about that? Are they sometimes called japonicas? They used to be. I think it was a, yeah. a, a common name applied to them. It was never their botanical name. But yes, I remember from garden centre times that people used to come in asking for japonica and that, that's yeah. what they meant was the, the Japanese quint, the shinomalus. I'm showing, I'm showing my age rather than yours, Gary. <laughs> but um, yeah, no, no, I, um, I love them just because uh, for picking, you get these little sprigs, uh, often from February, but certainly by March, um, as you say, on the bare branches. And um, yeah, very, very very good north uh, north facing wall shrub i think really really excellent but i love the idea of using them as a hedge too this particular variety as well the quince that actually grow the fruit 
um, is, is unique to this because a lot of the hybrids yes. that have been produced for the flowers have stopped producing fruit, but this one still produces fruit. Right. And you can, it is edible. You can cook it up and make the jellies or preserves with it, but um, equally useful for the birds. Okay, brilliant. So number three, that's mine, which is the Gelder Rose or Viburnum opulus, Roseum or Sterile. And it's just worth pointing out that that there are two types of Viburnum opulus. There's one that forms the berries that are almost like red currants in July and August. And then this is the one that doesn't form the berries. It has these really fantastically vivid, well, sort of soft green, but beautiful green pom-poms. And I have just totally fallen back in love with this shrub again. We have it either side of the arch as you come into the garden here from where visitors arrive through the meadow and into the perennial cutting garden. And it's just these wonderful sort of apple green pom-poms that then turn white and then rather brilliantly just sort of drop their petals quite elegantly uh, without browning very much. So it then becomes relatively boring sort of background thing but for April May and into early June I mean it's just such a such a fabulous plant it, you do need quite a lot of space for that I'd say you probably need well I mean fully grown R1 is is probably 10 foot tall now I would say by maybe about six foot wide but I should be doing meters but I think if you've got the space, there's almost nothing better for picking. You need to sear the stem end in boiling water and remove almost all or all the leaf and just leave the pom-poms behind. But it then makes a fabulous garden shrub and a fabulous vase uh, plant. I just love it. So back to you for number four. Number four, still in spring. It's a Deutzia, mm. Deutzia Nico. Um, I was chosen this one because I think shrubs, like I said, have many practical uses. And this is a great one for ground cover. I think many people have an area of the garden where they could just do without having to garden that area. There's enough to do already sort of thing. You need shrubs to kind of take up the spaces where they just look after themselves and they suppress the weeds and you can forget about that area and it continues to look nice without too much interaction. Mm -hmm. And this is a great plant for that. If you plant it upon mass, it creates probably two foot by five foot. Mm -hmm. So it's an ideal compact shrub, which is classed as ground cover. Mm. And it will just fill an area nicely and it's perfect for low maintenance. I'm not a fan of low maintenance gardens, but I certainly understand that you need areas of the garden to be low maintenance so you can focus on other areas. And I find this shrub really useful. It's got really pretty double white flowers throughout the spring and then great autumn colour as well. It goes bright red through the autumn. How lovely. Is it scented, that one? I don't believe so. No, okay. um, it could possibly be, but it's not something that I've ever noticed on it. No, no. Okay. But really good for pollinators again, isn't it? Yeah, and it's just it's the, the sheer mass of flowers throughout the spring. Yeah. It really covers it. It's pure white, double flowers hanging everywhere. Yeah, beautiful, beautiful. Well, mine is sort of uh, not dissimilar to that, except it's blue, which is a Teucrium, Teucrium fruticans. And it's a, it's a funny plant, that silver foliage, not sort of unlike rosemary, but more silvery somehow. It sort of reminds me a bit of rosemary. And then it has these blue, almost butterfly-like flowers. And I've really fallen back in love with that. My parents had it in their garden in Cambridgeshire on chalk, and I was unconvinced that it was going to be hardy here. So I've, I've been wary of it. But actually, we've done a trial of it here in a pot, and again, going for evergreens in pots, I think it's an absolute winner. And I just spent, uh, I w went on a wildflower trip to the Peloponnese in the Marnie. And there's a most wonderful garden there in a place where they do wildflower weeks at Ilias holidays. And the garden there is designed by Tanya Compton. And there is the most incredible sort of undulating, very low maintenance garden designed by her with a huge amount of different uh, lavenders like the French pedunculated uh, lavender stecus mixed in with rosemaries, uh, euphorbias and the teucrum. And um, it's just so stunning. It's really made me kind of think I, I really want to bring it back into the garden here, using it both in pots and in the sort of sunny, more Mediterranean borders. Are you keen on it as well, Gary? Yeah, I mean, it used to be a really popular plant yeah. when I worked down towards the, the south coast in Chichester area where it's quite windy as well. It's great for 
creating shelter in those coastal areas and the western coast of france as well is actually littered with it all the way down there people use it a lot because it's so tough against the salt spray and deals with the drought really well and the good news is that there's new forms being produced as well from france actually there's always been a compact version which i'm not too keen on it it looks a bit too a dwarf for me but I've saw the, the bigger varieties and there's a darker blue form being produced called Curacao. Ah. And we have got that. That, we, that is coming into the range this autumn. So I'm really excited to see that coming through. Great, great. Yes, yeah, um, Tani had planted the deep blue form and it was absolutely stunning. I mean, really like those rich deep blue rosemaries. Again, it gives that contrast between the flower and the silvery leaf. Is, is really totally beautiful. So that is definitely going on my shopping list for this autumn planting. I'm really uh, rather newly obsessed by them. And so what's your number four, Gary? Four is moving into summer for me. And I've chosen a Hebe, which it seems like ages since anybody's talked about Hebe's to me before. They seem to be quite popular in the 90s when I was growing up and everyone had them and then they just disappeared. Yes. And I know from a a grower's point of view that Hebe's have always been quite a challenge. They're quite susceptible to mildew when they're young and they're growing on in glass houses. But there's a new group of hebe's being released and we've got one of them called medieval pink princess it's really good at avoiding any mildew issues uh, it's very compact i think a lot of the ones from the 90s i remember they used to open up with age and you get big gaps in the middle of them and they look quite scraggly after a while so this retains that compact form doesn't have any uh, issues with health or why so a really good reintroduction if you like of hebe's into people's gardens great and like Many hebes, it's got the really interesting foliage colours there. It's almost like a pink and yellowy green foliage, evergreen, of course. And the flowers, small purple spike flowers, which come at the end of summer, are really good for pollinators mm, again. I remember. And, and the best thing about this is ideal for the small gardens, ideal for balconies. They are really nice and compact, probably no more than a metre by a metre mm. on full establishment so that's probably after maybe five or six years and I, I remember when I did the bees and butterflies um, blooms program for the BBC we did this rather amazing thing where we analyzed the glucose or sugar content of nectar and we found that Hebe actually as a family was one of the ones that were absolutely top of the tree and so they're particularly good for pollinators which is why you always see them so busy with bees I think they're just um, yeah. so intelligent that they know where they get the most grub, basically, or the most nutrition from their grub, perhaps. <laughs> well, they can they can smell it, can't they? I think they, they smell the sugar in the nectar and it's yeah. drawn to it. Yeah. So it's a, a useful plant, for sure. So my next one would be a buddleia. So it's sort of carrying on from hebes being quite sort of commonplace, but with new varieties getting exciting. Through you, we've started growing this buddleia, which is like a wisteria. And it, it's called, I think, Wisteria flora or something in its name. It's a Lindheania. Is that how you pronounce it, Kerry? You're better at this than me. <laughs> it's it's called, it, well, Wisteria Lane. Is yeah. The, the Birdly, isn't it? That's it. Wisteria that's Lane. it. That's it. Um, so I think Lindeliana is in the parentage for sure because of the way the flowers hang down on yes. the plants. Certainly. But. It's amazing. So we've got it in the herb and rose garden here and we've got it on the north side of quite a sunny wall but so it gets sun over the top but not at the base and I just couldn't believe it it grew really quickly like buddleias do but then it's so elegant it has these great sort of long panicles you know the the length of my forearm some of them and they literally look like wisteria. So they're sort of, you know, great pendulous, beautiful, beautiful purple inflorescences, whatever you call them, because it's a collection of flowers, isn't it? And um, wonderful perfume, of course, covered in pollinators, of course, flowered here, I think, from July until September. I was so blown away by them, I immediately ordered three from us and sent them to a friend for their 60th birthday because they just, I, I just think it's the most incredible new variety. And yeah, and we're going to plant more here around our new car park, actually, because it's it's just such a stunner. Wonderful for picking, wonderful for biodiversity, for pollinators, and a really fantastic garden or hedge plant. That leads quite nicely onto my next one for summer, actually, because it's quite similar to a buddleia. Oh, it's something a bit different. It's called Rostrinucula. I think I've got that right. It's because it's fairly new mm. to me. Uh, it's rarely seen shrub, and we've managed to get stock of it and cultivate it and now we've got a nice selection there to actually release this autumn mm. but it's originally from the hilly sort of landscape in, in China mm. so it's really hardy 
Um, what we'll find is, is if we get a strong, harsh winter here, it will die back to the ground, but it will for sure shoot from the roots again, mm. it back up. So certainly hard enough to grow in this country. But it has the most amazing dangling pendants of uh, pink lilac type buddlier flowers in it towards the end of the summer. Wow. And those flowers can go all the way up to December. Really Gosh. good length of uh, flowering period on it. And fantastic, like Budlia for all of the pollinators again. But just something a bit different. The flowers, they're not as long as a, a Budlia flower. They're a bit like the, do you remember Calistem and the bottle brush? Yes, they're yes. They're like that, but they're, they're dangling. It's really unusual. Wow. It's just something quite rarely seen. And if people like to try something a bit new and different in their garden, then this is going to be reliable for sure, certainly hardy, and it's worth giving it a go and see how you get on with it. Great. Uh, d- did you say what size it was, Gary? So it all depends on the winters. So obviously, right. if it will die back to okay. the ground, it's going to stay quite short. If you're in more of a warmer area, then it's going to reach probably the height of a buddleia yeah. still. It, you could see three meters on an established yeah. plant. Fabulous. That sounds good. Oh, I think all these, <laughs> I mean, obviously, I'm, I'm growing the ones that I'm talking about, but all yours, I think, sounds such exciting varieties. So my next one would have to be a classic, I'm afraid, because I just couldn't not mention it. I couldn't decide between hydrangea, limelight, which is a long-standing favourite here, or incredible. And in the end, I, I plump for incredible just because I have such fondness for it. And I think I may have talked about it on the podcast in previous episodes, but it's something I'm fond of because when I'm standing doing the washing up or um, whatever at the kitchen sink here, there's a window to the right in my field of vision. And these huge heads of incredible come to exactly that height of my eyes and they bob up and down and they're about the size of a human head. And I can't tell you how many times I've sort of had to double look because it's like, oh, is someone coming across the yard to visit? Oh, yeah. And it's it, I have to do a double take because it looks exactly like a human head. And um, I mean, obviously it doesn't because it doesn't have eyes and nose and a mouth, but they, they're exactly the same sort of shadowy scale as a human head. And they are so amazing. From sort of early summer, they start to form and you get these little green, almost gelder rose like the beginning of the flower. And then they expand and they expand and they expand and they open then sort of lovely, soft, sort of odonely green. Then they go white, then they go pinkish, and then they eventually are brown and are still really beautiful. And, and then you cut them down in the winter and then off they go again. They're incredibly low maintenance, really happy in moist shade. If you've got dry shade, you can still grow it, but you will need to put the hose at their roots every so often. But as long as they have either shade or moist, then they're happy. So one or the other, but dry shade together, um, they struggle a little bit. But I think that's one of my absolute favorite shrubs for summer into autumn. And you still find that you, should, you don't need to support no. it at all when it's in flower. No. It can hold its own weight. Exactly. And like Annabelle, yes. where you do need to add a bit of support on younger plants, this has the strongest yeah. end. So it's a baby. Um, it's a cross. It's a hybrid, isn't it, of Annabelle, which I know is incredibly popular and I love it too. But I do find it quite flop about. You know, I do find it just a little bit. It just, in, a, in the rain particularly, it just hangs its head. Whereas Incredible, no staking needed at all and it holds its heads really fantastically at human height and um yeah no i have a real fondness for that one so what's your last one gary um an old favorite if you like it's uh, a corner sanguinea mm. and the variety is called annie's winter orange ah. uh, so i think many people will recognize it when they see it it's the corners that you see autumn winter time with the bare stems that are colored orange red at the bottom slowly graduating to yellow at the top oh, wow. it just looks like there's fire in the hedge when you see them like I've always loved them. They're such an easy thing to achieve in the garden and a great sort of spectacle at that time of year. Mm. Uh, Annie's winter orange is an improved form again. So I think a lot of people have found that with older plantings of that cornice, they tend to lose their vibrancy over time. They become quite woody. Yes. Whereas Annie's is uh, a much better form for holding that color over a longer period. You can still prune to encourage the new growth, which has the stronger pillars. Yeah. But this one will hold that color into maturity much better oh great uh, so really good one to have if you're just starting out planting up a new garden and you've got big areas they look fantastic planted on mass at the back of a border yeah where they sort of disappear through summer with their plain green leaf and once everything dies down in front of it they come to life and add depth to the garden wonderful wonderful and uh, talking of which i use a lot of corners here i think i might just drop this in as a little sidestep 
for making a noughts and crosses grid to slot over bowls to make them into vases. And so what I do is I use the cornice and I love any coloured stem like that um, because it makes it more ornamental. And then I literally cut either four or five to go one way and then at right angles, four or five to go the other way. And I slot them over a bowl. And then as long as I tie, and I tend to use flexi tie because it's springy. And so as the natural stem shrinks, it shrinks with it and holds it. Whereas twine, it becomes baggy and falls apart. But as long as I tie all the knots going in the same direction, so from bottom, let's say from bottom left to top right, bottom left to top right, bottom left to top right, rather than some going from bottom right to top left, if you see what I mean, As long as I tie all the knots in the same direction, wherever I've got a crossing of the knots and crosses grid, you can concertina it away and fold it like a wine rack and hang it, put it in the drawer or hang it on a hook. And I find using it when it's dropped its leaves, any of the corners family, or I use the black bamboo, Phyllostachys nigra in the same way. And then as soon as, you know, things like dahlias or croissants or whatever with the huge heavy heads are getting a little bit too heavy for the stem I can just cut them quite short and slot them through the knots and crosses grid holding the flowers out of the water but on a short stem they last better and I also find that absolutely brilliant for camellias if you've got them from sort of December January February March camellias don't last in my experience the flowers drop really readily on a long stem but on a short stem they last much better so using cornus for flower arranging is also a really good thing I think so my final one is Circe de Filum. and the brilliant thing about this variety which you found and you'll remember its name better than mine Gary the more compact one which it's it's called Japonicum in fact isn't it but I grew up in um, partly in a garden in, on the west coast of Scotland where there was a Circe de Filum that there was at, you know was sort of 50 foot tall but this is one that's been bred I believe for smaller gardens and we planted it here three years ago and it's just coming into its own on the edge of the oast garden where the lawn meets the oast and the wall there and it's a really elegant I wouldn't call it a shrub more like a small tree and the wonderful thing about it is that in the autumn so this is my autumn contribution it smells of cooking sugar like toffee And it really does. Whenever I walk into that area, I get that incredible, amazing, really kind of nostalgic smell of making caramel, basically, or making toffee. And so I think that um, that's so exciting. I'm I'm really looking forward to the autumn. It's it's a great indicator as well when the soil is drying out. It's if the plant's under stress, it releases that smell of like candy floss. Ah. So then you know, oh, it's drying, there's drought on the way, we need to water. Oh, that's wonderful, Gary. There's so many lovely ideas. I've definitely made a list of more shrubs that I want to plant in the garden here with the Kynomalies and the the Daphne amongst them. But yeah, lots of brilliant ideas. Thank you so much. And I hope you'll come back and uh, be on the podcast again soon. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Thanks so much for listening to Grow, Cook, Eat, Arrange with me and Gary Newell. Next week, I'm back on my own, and that's because I want to tell you everything I know about year-round teasans and cordials, how to use the garden to give you delicious herb teas and delicious, lovely cordials from leaves and flowers. So see you then. You can find more information, photos and advice sheets on all the plants and recipes we talk about on this podcast by heading to the show notes or at sarahraven.com forward slash podcast.